Oh, this classroom is exactly the right size. Okay, so um, we're going to start where we uh, left off. Well, let me review a few things from last time. So we were studying electrodynamics in Minkowski space, and we're particularly interested in the behavior of the electromagnetic field near infinity, and there are are five different kinds of infinity, future null infinity, well, more than that, really, uh, past null infinity. And uh, this is the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space in which uh, light rays always travel at 45 degrees and lines of constant R look like this. And the boundaries of the diagram are all at r equals infinity. And in describing the behavior of the electromagnetic field at the infinite boundaries of Minkowski space, it's important to distinguish between the past of future null infinity, which we call scry plus minus, and the future of past null infinity, which we call scry minus plus, because the electromagnetic field that you find in Jackson or all elementary textbooks on electromagnetism are not continuous there. We will also be interested uh, at various points in the future of future null infinity, which we call scry plus plus, and the past of um, past null infinity, which we call scry minus minus. And these boundaries of scry are two spheres, and they're to be distinguished from uh, future time-like infinity, I plus, which is the place that uh, all time-like uh, geodesics go. And I minus, the place that they all come from, and spatial infinity, I zero, which is uh, a, a point, actually, where it conformally it's a point, whereas these are spheres. Okay, and we introduced um, retarded coordinates u equals t minus r, and advanced coordinates v equals t plus r which are finite at uh, past and future null infinity, respectively. And we have corresponding coordinate systems. ds squared is equal to minus du squared minus 2 du dr plus r squared gamma z z bar dz dz bar, uh, where gamma z z bar, z is a coordinate on the two-sphere, gamma z z bar is the round unit metric on the two-sphere. This is the metric that we'll use for describing things up here. On the other hand, if we want to, uh, of course, this is equal to the flat metric. We haven't come to gravity yet, dx dot dx uh, in flat Minkowski coordinates. And when we want to study things near past null infinity, we want to use advanced coordinates, which differ only in the sign of the VR term, dv dr term. 
Now, the main thing that we, ah, and I use the blackboard that gets covered. Um, the main thing that we uh, discussed last time is the fact that um, the, that we eventually wrote in this form, oh yes, and I wanted to say that we define the z in this coordinate system, in the advanced coordinates, uh, so that it's antipodally related to the z that appears in the retarded coordinates. So if uh, z equals zero were here, say the North Pole were here in advanced coordinates, in uh, sorry, in retarded coordinates, z equals zero would be at the antipodal point on the sphere in the advanced coordinates. And this seems like a funny thing to do, uh, but it, uh, we toyed with a variety of different notations, and uh, we uh, ended up with this as, as the one that seems a funny thing to do at this point, but it's going to save us a lot of uh, writing. And in particular, it enables us to write the boundary condition which the main result of last time was that standard Jackson electromagnetic fields obey the rather surprising boundary condition that F2 RU, the radial component of the electric field, as a function of ZZ bar of the 1 over R squared component of the electromagnetic field at scry plus minus is equal to F2 RV of ZZ bar at scry minus plus, where here and elsewhere, we, when we're, these superscripts mean that, uh, so when we expand the radial component of the electric field, we demand that uh, a, for large R, Finiteness of energy tells us that the order 1 and the order 1 over r term should be set to 0. And so the first term in the expansion will be F2. So this, sorry, FRU in general depends on r, u, z, and z bar. But we're expanding it as 1 over r squared F2 RU of u, z, z bar plus 1 over r cubed F3 RU of u z z bar plus dot dot dot. So this is the first F2 is the first non-trivial term in the expansion of the radial component, basically the radial component of the electric field at, um, at large r. And here we see the utility of the of the funny uh, antipodal relationship between the z and the advanced and retarded coordinates. If this weren't true, I'd have to write z antipodal. If I didn't use these coordinates, I'd have to, in this identity, uh, use uh, 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 have an explicit z antipodal there. And indeed, as we go on in this course, you will see that Really, the points up here are naturally <laughs> related, naturally tied to uh, the ones at the uh, uh, antipodal spot. OK. And um, so that is all just review from last time. Um, Ah, Z and Z bar, thank you. Yes, I am very appreciative of uh, corrections to my equations um, because I tend to make a lot of mistakes. All right. So any questions about this or anything that was covered last time? Yes. Right. Right. So if you see anything with a U in it, um, it will. It's advanced coordinates. Uh, sorry, retarded coordinates, and with a V in it, it would be advanced coordinates. 
Now, of course, it turns out that if we were that this is also equal to f r t because d by d t is equal to d by d u if you do the court. No, these aren't partials. But I'm just saying that if you do the coordinate transformation from u to t, you will, this will be equal to frt. This, of course, is equal to dr a u t No, sorry. It would be equal to dr a u 1 minus du a r 2 because the r derivative would uh, decrease, increase the power of r when acting on a. All right, so um, now we also defined it, defined charges, which I'm we wrote last time as. 1 over e squared epsilon star f at scribe plus minus. And some things are easier in form notation, which I'm using here. But sometimes it's useful to write things out explicitly using the coordinates. And so we can do that here. And this becomes 1 over e squared the integral of scry plus minus uh, integral d squared z, gamma z, z bar, um, f2 ru. So there's an, uh, an r squared in the Hodge dual here, which is uh, canceling the 1 over r squared in, in, in the in turning this into f to r u. And this is equal to times epsilon. Thank you. So this is equal to, by virtue of this boundary condition, 1 over e squared integral scry minus plus uh, d squared z gamma z z bar epsilon f2 rv, where I've defined my epsilon. Epsilon, eventually we're going to extend. For these formulas, I only need epsilon at scribe plus minus and scribe minus plus. Eventually, we're going to extend them. Uh, throughout the entire space time. Uh, right now, uh, we just need that epsilon z z bar at scribe plus minus is equal to epsilon z z bar at scribe minus plus. And with my coordinate conventions, that means that epsilon is not continuous at this point here. It's antipodally matched. And in a moment, we're going to integrate these formulas by parts. And then we're going to choose epsilon so that du epsilon is equal to 0 on scribe plus, And dv epsilon is equal to 0 on scribe minus. OK, so um, what we want to do next is simply to integrate these formulas by parts. and to do that, we want to use the constraint equations, which are that, so the constraint equations are the components of the Maxwell equation tangent. So let's talk about Q plus. And we're going to integrate it by parts and write it as a volume integral, the three-dimensional volume over the null hypersurface. In other words, it, it is, right now, it's an integral over a two-sphere here. But we're going to integrate it by parts and write it as something over this uh, 
over over scry plus. Yeah. Right. So um, right now, we're not going to say more about epsilon than we than we need to. So we could, and this question came up last time, we could, I did write volume integrals in form language. I'm about to write them out in components now. Um, we could integrate by parts and choose epsilon to be anything we wanted, and the relation would still be true. While true, it wouldn't be so useful. You know, it's nice to, there, it, 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 and it, it, it's true in general, and it's true in this particular case. And it behooves us to find a nice way to extend epsilon. And right now, we're only extending it um, up to uh, over past and future null infinity. Eventually, we're going to extend it over all of Minkowski space. And then I'm going to have to say more about how I did that, how I'm going to do that. So, um, so we have du. So the leading, the constraint equation near scry plus uh, has an expansion in powers of 1 over r. And um, the leading term in the expansion is just that du fr2u plus dz, let me define this in a second, fuz0 plus dz bar f0 u z bar is equal to uh, j u. j 2 u, and with my conventions, there's an e squared here, because I took all the e's out of the matter action and put them into the, um, into the multi had 1 over e squared multiplying the f squared action. And then I can write, oh, sorry. Um, so dz is the covariant derivative with respect to gamma z, it's just the covariant derivative on the round two sphere, and I'm raising the index with gamma z z bar. Now, gamma z z bar, I remind you, is the metric on the unit two sphere. It's not the metric. It differs by a factor of r squared from the metric, actual physical metric on the spacetime. But all the r squareds have canceled out here, uh, and this is the one, leading one over r squared component of the constraint equation. Okay, so now we just integrate this by parts, and we get that q epsilon plus is equal to minus 1 over e squared integral du d squared z. And that's, of course, a gamma z z bar. I think I'm going to uh, write this here. So q epsilon plus is equal to, that is, the one, the, the conserved charges associated with scry plus, it's minus 1 over e squared integral over scry plus du d squared z. Now, of course, it's just du of fru, but then we're going to substitute in for du of fru using this constraint equation. And what we get is uh, two terms, one um, which we can write after, uh, well, after uh, integrating by parts, we can write as, on the two sphere, as dz epsilon f0 u z bar plus dz bar epsilon 
F0 UZ, and then plus the integral over scribe plus du d squared z gamma z z bar j2 u. And I want to write this as equal to, um, notice the factors of e squared cancel there. And I want to write this as equal to a soft term, Q soft plus, which is this, and a hard term, Q hard plus, which is this. So let me make a few comments about this. First of all, I wrote this equation last time in form notation. I'm just writing it out in components now. Uh, secondly, in principle, there would be another boundary term at scry plus plus. And that boundary term would be important uh, and will be important if there's anything going on up here, like massive particles or black holes or something like that. But w for now, we are uh, talking about massless charges only. Massive charges can be dealt with in this framework, but this is the simplest case, and uh, we're, 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 doing, we're doing it first. Um, J. Well, J is the source term in the Maxwell equation. It's the, it's the matter charge current. So that's why I am calling this the hard term. This is sort of a, f a field theory uh, terminology. These are just hard matter particles. If we were discussing the LHC, these would be jets, uh, ultra-relativistic jets, because they're going to un uh, null uh, infinity. And um, this is the kind of term, if epsilon is constant, this is the only term. And this simply collapses to the sum of charges that are piercing the total charge that flux through, through future null infinity. Thank you. Now, if epsilon is not constant, then this hard term is still there. But it has a kind of unfamiliar form because we are weighting the charges which pierce null infinity by an arbitrary function that depends on the angle that they're going out at. And, but we can still have a conserved quantity if we can so compensate for that by adding this term, which we call a soft term. So let's talk a little bit more about this soft term. And I'll explain why it's called soft. So we can write this, um, let us define, this involves, before we do the z integral, remember epsilon doesn't depend on u. So, so we have something here which is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f0 uz in this second term here. Now. If we were to put in here an e to the i omega u, this would be a Fourier co component with frequency omega um, of the electromagnetic field. And moreover, it is um, a component of, we can think of this as an electric field. Z is transverse to null infinity. So it's a, a component of the electromagnetic field which is transverse to infinity. So this, um, and this, since epsilon doesn't depend on u, um, if epsilon depended on u, we would have other components here. But since epsilon doesn't depend on u, 
this is a uh, this if we promote this to a quantum operator, it will create and annihilate, and as we will do either later in this lecture or tomorrow, it will create and annihilate photons. It's linear in the electromagnetic field. So it will create or annihilate outgoing photons of frequency omega. But there is no omega in this expression. This term isn't there. So it's as if we took omega to 0. So this thing creates and annihilates soft particles. It creates or annihilates particles with zero energy. And that's why we call this the soft term. And it's linear in the electromagnetic field, whereas this current here, for example, if we had a charged fermion or a charged boson, would be a quadratic uh, it would, would be a quadratic term. OK, now there's something else we can say about this, which is if we take dz bar, let's call this nz, and its complex conjugate, which involves fuz bar, would be n z bar. So if we take d z bar n z minus d z n z bar, that is equal to integral from minus infinity to infinity d u um, d z bar f u z minus d z f u z bar, all with zeros here, but then we can use the Bianchi identity to relate this to minus infinity to infinity d u d u f zero z z bar. Maybe there's a sign there. Let me not check it. And so this is a boundary term, which is the magnetic field at um, the uh, boundaries, at the past and future boundaries. And um, we're going to assume now uh, that Uh, at scribe plus plus, scribe minus minus. Now, we're going to assume now that this is equal to zero. We're just going to assume this. And for now, we are assuming that we are describing a theory with no asymptotic states carrying magnetic charge. In other words, we're talking about theories with no magnetic monopoles. Now, it's very interesting to think magnetic monopoles are interesting. Uh, we want to think about magnetic monopoles. Again, we want to study one thing at a time. Uh, but later on, we are going to include magnetic monopoles. We can no longer oppose this assumption. Um, and in fact, everything is going to get corrected in a very interesting way. But I'm trying to keep it simple. So for now, we're going to talk only about theories in which there aren't magnetic monopoles. And of course, if there aren't magnetic monopoles, there can't be uh, long-range magnetic fields. All right. Now, if this is true, if this is equal to 0, then uh, dz, then it must be that nz is dz of something. And so I'm going to. Um, Yeah, scribe plus plus, scribe plus minus. Thank you. Yes? It's integral. It's u integral. Yes, we're going to work all those out.
It certainly commutes with a Hamiltonian. Um, well, ask me that question when I write down the commutation relations. I don't think there's any consistent. It's, it's non-trivial as a quantum operator. It, we're going to write down its commutation relations explicitly. And it commutes with the Hamiltonian. All right. So, um, so we often want to. So I'm going to throw in a factor of e squared to make my life easier later. And I'm going to call this e squared dzn, where n is a real function. Of course, any nz in this is a, uh, a one form on the sphere, whole, uh, the holomorphic component of a one form on the sphere. The, it can always be written as dzn for some complex n on the sphere. Um, but this condition implies that n is real. Again, this will no longer be true when we include magnetic monopoles. And if we take the gauge condition that au0 is equal to 0, then fuz, which we will do, so these are gauge condition and a, a, a dynamical restriction that we're making. Um, then it follows that this is just equal to uh, az0 at scry plus plus minus uh, az0 at scry plus minus. So this thing, which I'm going to call the soft photon, is the difference between the, uh, the z component of the gauge field at the top of scry plus and the bottom of scry plus. It's the shift in the gauge field between here and here. Now, if we want to have finite energy, the gauge field better be pure gauge at both the beginning and the end. So, and indeed, A's, these things, that's and the shift in them had also better be pure gauge. And the shift of them is this function n, or more precisely, e squared times n. AU0 should be, we can work in a, we're going to work in a gauge in which AU0 is equal to 0. And that's consistent with what we said earlier that um, uh, that we're taking epsilon not to depend on U. Now, we could have considered a more general situation in which AU didn't have to be 0. And epsilon could vary. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't have learned anything extra from doing that. Um, OK. So this soft photon, if you like, is the shift, or this NZ, it's the shift in, it's the gauge transformation which relates the uh, pure gauge field configuration at the top and the bottom of, of scry plus. And note that this field itself, uh, well, sorry, I can, I'll come to that a little bit later. OK. All right. So now, we have an infinity of conserved charges. And Nether's theorem uh, tells you how there's a connection between conserved char charges and symmetries. Another, yes?
No. No. We mean that Q plus epsilon is equal to Q minus epsilon. Right? So if we compute some incoming, so the usual statement would be in a scattering problem, would be if you take all the incoming charges, uh, that's equal to the sum of all the incoming charges is equal to the sum of all the uh, outgoing char charges. Here we have a, a, a generalization of that. Now, you could also, if you wanted, take surfaces like this and define charges uh, at, at intermediate times. Um, it, it's especially, it's, it may, I don't know if there's more to be learned uh, from, from that or, or not. Well, in fact, when we were applying this to black holes, we were, uh, we, we were doing thing like that, but things like that. But for now, we're really interested in this statement. It relates something about the incoming state to something about the outgoing state. OK, so um, how do you go from Nether's theorem takes you from symmetries to charges? How do you go from charges to symmetries? Well, if you have a Hamiltonian formulation of the theory, then the charges, uh, if you have a, a Q which commutes with H, then uh, you can ask what, uh, what, do that, what does that charge generate? So what we want to do now is to talk about a Hamiltonian formulation of electrodynamics and just work out what this charge generates, what this conserved charge generates. So in a Hamiltonian formulation, um, one has A phase space gamma with coordinates Q I P J, where J runs from one to half the dimension of the phase space. If we were just talking about a particle in three dimensions, then we would have a six-dimensional phase space. I would run from one to three. But here, really, I becomes a continuous, in field theory, I becomes a continuous uh, uh, index, an infinite dimensional phase space. And we can write this, we can lump these together into some xi, which is a coordinate on the entire phase space gamma. And then we have the symplectic form to define the Hamiltonian dynamics. We have a symplectic form on this space, which we write as a half omega ij dxi, a symplectic two form, dxi wedge dxj. And that implies that quantum commutators, of course, we could talk about the classical story too, and there are classical symmetries here and so on, but we're, I think I'm just going to go quantum now, um, implies that the quantum commutators are equal to I times uh, omega has to be, is obviously anisymmetric and has to be invertible between two functions on phase space, it's dIA, dJB. OK, so finding the commutation relations in a quantum theory amounts to describe, you start with the classical phase space, and then you need to find a symplectic form on that, fa on that phase space. Yes.
feel we should spend this pot uh don't spend the time with that you know that kind of question that you just asked there? Um I think I'm about to answer that question. Um so um So how do we describe the um, classical uh, phase space? Well, the classical phase space I I in electromagnetism, you can take any, you can define it as the allowed uh, initial data on any Cauchy surface, which I'll, which I'll call sigma. So we can take any Cauchy surface here in Minkowski space. And then you can show, and this is a homework problem, uh, and there are many papers on this, that um, the symplectic form for electrodynamics can be written as minus 1 over e squared um, for free electrodynamics is minus 1 over e squared, the integral over sigma delta, which I'll define in a moment, and the Hodge dual of F times um, wedge delta A. So if I ignore these deltas here, I'm, I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you something else. Let's ignore the delta function here. Then I would have star F wedge A. Star f is a two form. That's a three form. I can integrate it over to any uh, uh, three surface, and I want to pick any asymptotically complete asymptotic space-like slice. But now delta a is a variation of the gauge field uh, a. It in so we have a, some set of initial data which are described. So we have a big infinite dimensional space, which is the space of all uh, uh, one forms on sigma. And we consider one forms on sigma, but then we take the one form on uh, the phase space gamma. So delta A is a one form on the phase space gamma. So this is a wedge product on the infinite dimensional manifold that describes uh, that this this um, this this phase space, and so this is kind of a um, if we write this out, I can write this out in terms of uh, indices. We can also write it as minus one over e squared, the integral over sigma. the uh, normal volume element to sigma, which is the induced metric times the unit normal of um, delta FAB, delta AB. This is another way of writing it. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, so I've given it to you as a uh, homework problem. OK, so what we want to do now is to take sigma equal to scry plus. And that is a very nice thing to do because up at scry plus, uh, everything is um, it's essentially free field theory because uh, all the all everything uh, spreads out and becomes weak. Yes. That's right. So that's right. Um, okay. So yes. Um, We should take that into account. So let's say now we're just working out the symplectic form for pure electromagnetism. And then we'll, we have to discuss how 
uh, is corrected for that. Okay, so um, now the nice thing is that um, okay, so this becomes very simple. Omega on scribe plus is equal to minus one over e squared um, du d squared z delta f zero uh, uz wedge, and this is a wedge on phase space, delta a z bar. Um, plus delta f zero u z bar wedge delta a zero z. Okay, now, and this is a very tricky point which a lot of people had gotten wrong in the past. You have to, we need to be, in this story, we have to be very careful about what is happening at the boundaries of, of scribe plus and minus. And so what we want to do is um, to define A0Z. And also we're interested in doing Fourier transforms. So we're going to define a zero z as equal to a hat z, so all these things depend on u z and z bar, um, plus e squared d z a new field c, which is going to turn out to be the co canonical conjugate to n, um, uh, where d z c is defined as 1 over 2 e squared times the sum of a z 0 at scribe plus 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 a 0 z z at scribe plus minus. And uh, the point here is that if you have a function, uh, I'm, I'm not going to show this, but the elementary theory of Fourier transforms, a function which um, uh, has a Fourier transform must have the sum of its boundary values equal to zero. That is, um, if we try to take a Fourier transform of a zero z, which where the sum of the two boundary values uh, is zero, we'll get uh, some divergence when near omega goes to zero, and it won't m won't make sense. So a hat z is the part of a zero z that has a Fourier transform, and we have to separately pull out this piece which does not have a Fourier transform. C, of course, is completely U independent. Right? I should have written that. So these de all depend on U, Z, Z bar, U, Z, Z bar. And this depends only on Z and Z bar. And again, C is a real function because we're demanding that the uh, electromagnetic field, the, the magnetic field vanish at the boundary. OK, so having done this, we can substitute into here. And in fact, I think what I'd like to do now, because I've written a lot of formulas on, on the board, I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise, which will make you stare at these formulas. So um, if we do this, we find that Omega scribe plus, first of all, has the obvious term that you expect du d squared z du uh, 
delta a z hat wedge delta a z bar hat and then there's plus some number times d squared z dz c wedge dz bar delta n and there's a delta c here okay so what I want you to do is um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you two minutes and I want you to try to compute what this number is and you should compare uh, compare with with your neighbor and what this equation says is that the components of A that uh, have a Fourier transform are paired with each other in the symplectic form and the soft photon mode is paired with this field C that is the sum of the boundary endpoints. So I'm going to I'm going to give you yes thank you Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes and com please, please compare with your neighbor.
Okay, I think that's two minutes. Um, but we're running into our five minute break. So let me just tell you that the number here is plus two e squared. Let's see if you got it right. Um, all right, so let's, let's take, let's uh, break for five minutes. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is talk about the commutators. And as you see from the second line up there, um, to get the commutators, you have to invert this, uh, this two form. And we see that since it's a sum of terms, one of which involves only a hat and the other of which involves only the boundary fields, let me refer to C and N as boundary fields because they live on the boundaries of uh, Scry, that uh, we can invert them separately. And so let's look at the first one. This one implies, if you invert it, the commutator uh, A, well, let me write it as du a z hat commutator with a hat w bar. Well, let me write it out a little more detail. As a function of u, z, and z bar, commutator with a w bar as a function of u prime. Uh, W, W bar is equal to um, minus I E squared over four delta U minus U prime delta squared Z minus W. In other words, these this thing pairs d u a hat with z with a hat z bar at the same um, at the same point. So we get this delta function here, and the one over e squared uh, becomes an e squared. And the, there's some factors of two that you have to be uh, that you have to be careful with. Now we could integrate this. And uh, then we get something like this. And this becomes a theta function where theta of u minus u prime is equal to 1 over pi i uh, integral d omega over omega e to the i omega u. And it's equal to minus 1 for u less than u prime and plus one for u greater than u prime. Yeah. Yes, thank you. OK, so that's a standard kind of light cone uh, commutator. But uh, we also can compute, yes. Yeah. OK, so we can also compute a commutator between C and N. These don't depend on U. They're just, there's only a, a Z integral there, not a U integral. And now what I have there is DZC. Um, with dz bar n. Here I'm just writing c and n. And so I get minus i 4 pi over 4 pi e squared log absolute value of z minus w squared. And really, this, is, this commutator is only determined up to dz 
c dz bar. So I could have here plus a function of z plus some function of w, something that doesn't couple them. And at various points, you have to be careful of this. We're going to ignore them uh, for now. Uh, in fact, in our expressions, so if we look, for exa example, at our expressions for there, it only involves uh, dz and so these corrections wouldn't. It's it, for certain computations you would have to worry about those, but and then we'd have to decide exactly what they are. Similarly, for the constant term uh, in here, we could have shifted the theta function, but uh, uh, those won't. Th those won't enter into what I'm uh, about, about to say. OK, but now we can easily compute um, q plus epsilon with a z 0 of u z z bar. And we see that q plus epsilon um, involves, where did I write it? Did I? OK, q plus epsilon involves this e squared dzn. And so, uh, and on the other hand, yeah. OK, so if I take um, uh, dzc um, dw bar n, that's equal to minus i over 4 pi e squared dz dw bar log z minus w squared. And so I hit with the first thing, and I get a 1 over z bar minus w bar. And then I use the formula, which we will be using dz bar of 1 over z minus w is equal to 2 pi delta squared z minus w. Oh, because just because I'm because uh, delta c and delta n are symplectically paired at the same point on the sphere. Okay. So. Um, what is this equal to? Well, a zero. So q has a linear term in it, which is um, when I wrote it out up there, which is a term involving the matter fields, and then there's a linear term in it, which has a dz epsilon uh, dz bar n. I think I wrote a formula for it and then erased it. Um, so. Uh, Q has an N in it, the soft photon. And the soft photon N does not commute with A0Z because I have to, uh, it does commute with A hat because there is no A hat in Q when I write it as a scribe plus integral, but there is an N. And um, a0 is a hat plus c, and c does not commute with n. So what I learn after all that is that q plus epsilon with a0z is i dz epsilon. And similarly, I could have done a similar calculation on scry minus. And now, you know, in principle, I ought to, well, 
a0, I could write this as a0, z, v, z, z bar. That would also be equal to i dz epsilon. I could have computed the symplectic form on scry minus in exactly the same way. And also, I can learn, what else can I learn? I can learn that q plus epsilon with n is equal to 0, q plus epsilon with a hat z is equal to 0, and q plus epsilon uh, with uh, dzc, with e squared dzc, is also equal to i dz epsilon. OK, but this is the one I want to, I'm interested in right now. Now we can also, what happens if we have, uh, suppose we, we also have some matter in our field. So that came from taking the, uh, the commutator of the first term, which involves the electromagnetic field, with the gauge field itself. And from that term, we would conclude that the symmetry that uh, is generated by q plus epsilon in a canonical formulation is just gauge transformations generated by epsilon. In other words, q epsilon is the generator of the gauge transformations with parameter epsilon. I mean, of course, we've long known that for epsilon is equal to constant, that the total charge generates constant gauge transformations on all the fields. In that case, it would commute with the abelian gauge field. Um, but here, we see that even when epsilon is a function, it generates these uh, uh, gauge transformations which are uh, n acting on A are uh, non-trivial. We call them large gauge transformations because they are gauge transformations that don't uh, die off at infinity. Um, they go to angle dependent uh, constants at infinity. Angle dependent but U independent uh, constants in infinity. And moreover, from the scry minus calculation, we would get the antipodally related uh, gauge transformation. So they're, they're pretty weird gauge transformations that where uh, the value of the gauge parameter approaches one, one constant on scry plus, which doesn't depend on retarded time at a fixed angle. And on scry minus, if we go to the opposing angle, the antipodal angle, uh, it will approach the same value. That's the behavior of these functions, epsilon. Now, in order to really call it a gauge transformation, we should also check that it properly generates the gauge transformations on the matter field. And that's the role of the second term there. The so-called hard term. So uh, in general, um, if we want to construct an abelian gauge theory, we start out with an ungauged theory with a global symmetry, a global U1 symmetry, and then uh, we gauge it. And the global U1 symmetry will give us a global conserved current which is nothing but the ju. And by the nether construction, whatever your matter fields are, that ju will uh, canonically generate the global uh, transformations. And in other words, uh, the integral over scry plus, or this could be any surface, of epsilon with star j by the nether construction with any field phi k of charge uh, qk will be equal to 
minus QK epsilon of Z, Z bar times phi K of U, Z, Z bar. This is U, Z, and Z bar. So it follows that um, th and this is just well, this is just equal to Q plus epsilon with the expected gauge transformation of Q plus epsilon with phi k. So indeed, we conclude that the sum of the hard and the soft term properly generates these local angle-dependent uh, gauge transformations on scribe plus. Any questions? Have you derived these commutation relations with um, Q plus epsilon? Are you including the hard term? Or is that you mean for A? Yeah. Uh, no, but the hard term is constructed only from the matter fields. Uh, wait, sorry, what's your question? Oh, my question was the, the soft return should be commuted with just any matter. The soft return should be compu commuted with any, with the, with the matter, yeah. So, so it's, uh, maybe it's like this individual uh, identification uh, is not maybe too surprising because if you even like can theorize the one particle without like scattering just lines with the terms for both of those with the terms of the equation. Right. Uh, just the, in the past, we count the charges from uh, that angle, and everything just, just goes uh, to a cubital form from this cubital. And uh, so that's not surprising. Yeah. Even, even without any charge. Yeah. It's, it's not surprising when you think about it the right way. Yeah. <laughs> any, any more questions? Yes. Um, no, I don't think I dropped the I. This is equal to I delta epsilon of the field phi k. So a field phi k would transform as delta, you know, phi k under a, would go like E to, uh, I Q K epsilon phi K. And these Q Ks are not the conventional ch electric charges. These Q Ks are integers. The, um, you know, usually you might have a factor of E up here and the one over E and the Q K would not be. Anyway, this is the simplest convention for this. So for field theory, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, it's, it's an awkward convention. All right. So um, what have we done so far? We found that there are an infinite number of conserved charges in electromagnetism. Um, and we showed that there is canonically associated with these charges an infinite number of uh, gauge symmetries. And actually, I hadn't. Uh, maybe I'll talk about that next time. These, I'll, say, I'll say more about this next time. But these can be thought of as, um, you know, usually you would think that states in a gauge theory are annihilated by all invariant under all uh, gauge transformations. But that's only true when the gauge transformations are uh, behaving trivially at infinity. And in some cases, there are large gauge symmetries. Um, 
that act non-trivially on, uh, on the Hilbert space. And you might try to find those. And indeed, that was how I originally found these symmetries. You might try to find them by just by doing some uh, gauge fixing and looking at what the residual gauge transformations are and doing an asymptotic expansion and seeing what the uh, what 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 it what is le left over, and maybe I'll say a few words about that, not this time, but but next time. Uh, but now I'm going to move on to compute a associated with this gauge symmetry. Whenever you have a symmetry uh, in a in a quantum theory, you have something called a Ward identity. So what is the Ward identity? So the Ward identity are just the dynamical consequences from the fact that the conserved charges commute with the S matrix. Or in other words, since the S matrix can be thought of as the exponential of I H T, where T is the time and the limit where T goes to infinity, it's the same as the statement that the charges commute with the Hamiltonian. So um, in particular, it should be that if we take an outgo any outgoing state and act on it with q plus epsilon, and um, uh, so, sorry, uh, we have an S, in a quantum theory, we have an S matrix S. And we have out states. And we have scattering amplitudes, which we can write in this form. And if the charge is conserved, it should be true that out q plus epsilon, which is the form of the charge acting on the out states, s uh, minus s q minus epsilon in is equal to 0. So this is just a statement that the charge commutes with the S matrix. If we exponentiate the charge to get a generator of the finite symmetry, it's just the statement that if you have some in state x that evolves to an out state y, and then you do a large gauge transformation on the in-state x, it will evolve to a large gauge transformation on the out-state y. This is the, this is, the discussion I was giving here was really, um, I mean, I did write quantum commutators because I'm about, but now is when I'm really starting to use the quantum language. This was really kind of a semi-classical discussion. And uh, now we're, this is the quantum version of the statement that, uh, that the charge is conserved. So if in particular in the case that, that epsilon is a constant, it says that if you take q, the sum of the incoming charges is equal to the sum of the outgoing charges. I'm talking about Ward. What I mean, Ward identity is a pretty general term, which means relationships between objects that are applied by symmetries. OK, so what I mean here is that uh, if you have some symmetry, if you have something which commutes with the Hamiltonian, um, um, then uh, you, know, you can always get some relationship between, th between scattering amplitudes, given one set of scattering amplitudes you know the relationship between the charged. So 
scattering amplitudes. And Q plus epsilon, of course, is equal to Q minus epsilon um, because they can both be written as boundary conditions, as boundary terms near, near spatial in infinity. This subscript minus just means that here I want to, superscript minus just means that here I want to write Q epsilon in a form appropriate for acting on in states. And here, in evaluating this Ward identity, I want to write Q plus epsilon in a form appropriate for acting on out states. Well, I wouldn't say it that way. I would say if you want to get identities for correlation functions, which this will certainly give you, you have to find a prescription for defining epsilon everywhere in the interior and thereby, d therefore, defining. It's not the question I'm addressing. Right. Yeah. That might be. That might be true, but and one could try to discuss uh, more carefully what the what loop corrections to this would look like, and then we would have to get into details of the theory, and it would depend how things, you know, how thing, what kind of, you know, the infrared behavior and anomalous dimensions in the theory, and so on. We could try to do that directly in this l language, but as you know. What I'm about to do is relate this whole story to, uh, to the soft theorem, where all of this has been very carefully addressed. So if you, if you want, you could say, uh, you could say, uh, you could phrase it a little differently. You could say, if this, uh, these charges are conserved in the quantum theory and don't have anomalies, then this will be true. We can check what the, what the, uh, what the quantum version of this statement is, and we can verify directly using Feynman diagrams, as we'll see, that it is true. Um, OK. So. Now we can write this in the form out Q soft plus, and here I'm dropping the epsilon, it's implicit, S minus S Q soft minus in is equal to minus out uh, Q hard plus S minus S Q hard plus N. And um, Now, what are these things? Well, Q minus epsilon on N. So in this form, I've written the identity as uh, in terms of the original S matrix element um, with some insertions, which are going to correspond to soft photons is equal to the original elements with some insertions, which are going to turn out to just uh, be give C numbers acting on, on the, uh, the in and out states. So uh, Q minus epsilon n, first we have the soft term, which we can write as minus 2 d squared z dz bar epsilon dzn. And here I'm going to put a superscript minus on this field n, 
because when I introduced n before, I was talking about scribe plus on the in state. And then now I'm going to assume that my in state can be described by uh, m hard particles that are coming in um, at uh, angles, the points on the sphere uh, denoted by zk. So I have a minus the sum of k equals 1 to m, uh, qk in, and then epsilon of z in k, z bar in k. In. So that's what I get from that second term, the, 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 the hard term there, uh, that J, the, the current acting on any incoming hard particle, say a massless electron, will just give the, the charge of that uh, hard particle. And the factors of E squared uh, have, have all canceled here. But since the integral is weighted by the epsilon, I get the epsilon evaluated at the point on the sphere where the particle came in, which I'm denoting z in sub k. z in sub k is the z coordinate of, let me draw the picture here. So there's a sphere down here, and every particle is coming in from scry minus and it's coming in at some point, z in k. And then we'll also have hard particles going out. They're going, going to be going out at z out k. Similarly, um, out q plus epsilon is equal to minus 2 d squared z dz bar epsilon out dzn uh, minus the sum from k equals 1 to n. I'm going to have n outgoing particles, m incoming particles, qk out times epsilon at z out k z bar out k. Um, okay, now notice the factor of 2 here. In the original expression, I had two terms, one involving dz bar epsilon dzn, and the other one in dz epsilon dz bar n but I'm on a sphere, and I can integrate by parts and swap those two around, so I'm just saving myself a little bit of writing. Okay, so um, So finally, we can write that as minus 2 d squared z dz bar epsilon dz out n s minus s n minus, where this depends, n depends on z, in is equal to the sum of k equals 1 to m qk in epsilon of zk in. I'll, I don't need to write, it also depends on z bar. I don't, won't that be implicit. Uh, minus the sum k equals 1 to n, q 
QK out, epsilon evaluated at ZK out times out S in. It's not exactly the same thing as n minus, no. When you have magnetic charge, they're importantly different. But when there are no magnetic charges, it turns out that these two terms are, are equal up to a sign. OK, so what is this now? So we have an infinite number of Ward identities one for every function epsilon on the sphere. And they relate um, any S matrix element between any incoming and any outgoing state times some function, uh, which, is, which we could, I guess we could start calling now the soft factor. And that is equal to the same S matrix element uh, with the insertion of some soft photons. Okay. So what? So 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 that is a, a very uh, general relation, and it would be incredibly surprising if uh, after you know whatever it is now ninety years of uh, quantum electrodynamics, we discovered an infinite number of new relationships between uh, scattering processes. And of course, we haven't done that. What we've done is uh, given, uh, we've rediscovered some relations which have been known for a long time, uh, but were described using very different methods, using mode expansions and uh, and Feynman diagrams. And what we want to do next is to show that this relationship, which we derived as the Ward identity of a symmetry following from some conserved charges, is the same thing as the uh, so-called uh, soft theorems in, in abelian gauge theories, which indeed is already looking very suspicious because indeed those soft theorems relate, give a relationship between any S matrix element and the same S matrix element with a soft uh, photon inserted. OK, but now, in order to show that that's really true, we still have to do some more work. And the main thing we have to do is transcribe notation. Because here, we're, we're, we've just presented some things in a radically different way. We've characterized our particles by the points that they come in from the sphere at null infinity. Um, we've worked in terms of advanced and retarded coordinates. We have this, this funny antipodal matching going on. And whereas in usual investigations uh, in quantum field theory, one always works in a basis of, of plane waves. So basically, we have to take this formula now and transform it in terms of, a, 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 and rewrite it in terms of a plane wave basis. And at the same time, we want to uh, give some mode, and also relate it to the conventional kind of mode expansion for A. Now, when you, study in physics 253 or whatever, uh, here I've written down some commutation relations for uh, the electromagnetic field for the, what we should, since they're on sky plus, we should probably call them the out fields. And it's not at all obvious that these are the same as what you've seen in, 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 uh, in 253. But of course they are. Um, and indeed, 
one way to see that they are, I guess it's not what I'm going to do, but uh, when we took this in this covariant symplectic form on phase space, you know, we evaluated it by pushing it up to scribe plus. And uh, the way, one way to recover, and it's uh, straightforward to show that this symplectic form does not depend on the surface sigma. I can't remember if that was part of the homework problem or it wasn't part of the whole homework problem, but it's there's a million papers on that. It does not depend on the on on the uh, choice of surface sigma. And if you chose the surface sigma to just be a t equals zero slice in flat space and expanded this in a plane wave basis, you would get the standard uh, commutation relations that you would use in 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 physics 253. I'm not going to take that route. Um, So let me instead do this. So we're going to start by going back to the standard Cartesian coordinates for Minkowski space. And in physics 253, um, one writes a mu of x is equal to um, E times the sum over polarizations, alpha equals plus or minus, integral d cubed q over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 omega, epsilon alpha, the polarization vector star, of q. So epsilon has to be, so we have two polarization vectors which are must be transverse to q. Epsilon alpha dot q is 0. Um, a, then we have a uh, annihilation operator. So this would be the field on scry plus. A alpha out, which is a function of Q. E to the I, four vector Q dot X, where Q squared is equal to zero. So it's uh, om uh, so omega squared minus Q squared is equal to zero. Uh, e to the I Q dot X, and then we have plus epsilon mu alpha of q uh, alpha a alpha out of q dagger, a creation operator, e to the minus i q dot x. And then we have that A alpha out of Q, A beta out of Q prime dagger is equal to delta alpha beta Two pi cubed, two omega, delta cubed, q minus q prime. Okay, this is a standard formula for the commutation relations of the electromagnetic field, free electromagnetic field, outgoing. Sorry? Yeah, I 
No, no, everything is out. I'm just expanding the outgoing field here. Yeah, I guess I could have put. Well, no, epsilon is a c. Epsilon is just a function of q. A, a is an operator. A, the a and a dagger are operators. I haven't written in anywhere, but were I to write in, I would be free to use the same epsilon to define my, my in, in going operators. A pi is also the same for in and out. OK, so this is a standard formula uh, from, from, from QFT. I'm not going to derive it. Hopefully, it, it, looks, um, it looks familiar. Uh, all right, now what I'm going to do, presumably, is suddenly it's going to start to look very unfamiliar because um, I want to rewrite this formula in retarded coordinates. And then I want to, and I, I think I'm not going to get very far, but I want to get to one formula, which there's a, a homework problem on. So um, we want to rewrite this to you to to take these rewrite all our quantities on scry in terms of these familiar creation and annihilation operators. And so what we do, so recall that the, re the retarded coordinates, t equals u plus r, and there would be a similar construction for ingoing fields. Uh, and then we have, this is written in terms of x1, x2, x3, and we have x1 plus i, x2 is equal to 2rz over 1 plus zz bar. And x3 is equal to uh, r times 1 minus zz bar over 1 plus zz bar. So if you invert this, which you can, if you invert this, and plug it into that thing up there, you get that ds squared is equal to minus du squared minus 2 du dr plus r squared gamma zz bar dz dz bar. Okay. Um, now, what we want to do is we want to take q mu. So Q is a, uh, so how many, so Q squared has to be equal to, Q four vector squared has to be equal to zero. So the Q is labeled um, by a, a point on the sphere up to its overall magnitude. So we can label Q by, so here we have some null vector. Let's call this Q. We have a null vector, and it ends up some point on the sphere. It's directed towards some point on the sphere, which I'm going to call W. So there's a natural map from null four vectors Q to points W on the sphere. By the way, there is no natural map to points on the sphere, uh, uh, Lorentz invariant map from points on the, on the sphere to from four vectors that are not null. And that, so we're going to have to do more work. There's something interesting that can be done, but we're going to, that's why we're, we're going to have to do more work when we get to massive particles that don't uh, square to zero. So we can write this as omega 1 plus w w bar times um, 1 plus w w bar w plus w bar 
i w minus w bar uh, 1 minus w w bar. And this is equal to q0, q1, q2, q3 for a q which points towards the point w. OK, so just to take one example of this, let's suppose that w is taken to the, be the north pole. Let's suppose that w is equal to 0. If w is equal to 0, then we find, so for w equals 0, this goes to just omega. My omegas look, unfortunately, like my w's. Omega, this just becomes um, 0, 0, 1. Ah, still an omega here. So for omega equals 0, this is just a vector that points in the x3 direction, which is uh, the north pole on the sphere. And more generally, if w is some point on the sphere, this would be the four vector that it, that it corresponds to. Now why are we doing this? We're doing this because the natural way to understand the symmetries in the charges is by describing everything in terms of points on the sphere at infinity rather than, uh, rather than, f than f the four momenta. OK, now it turns out, and it's an interesting exercise, which I think I, I didn't assign, um, that we can now also write the polarization vectors, the two polarization vectors, which are orthogonal to Q, as epsilon plus mu of Q. Its components then are uh, 1 over the square root of 2, w bar 1 minus i w, and epsilon minus mu of q is equal to 1 over the square root of 2. Uh, it's a complex conjugate of this, w1 i w, this guy's barred. And these obey q dot epsilon plus or minus is equal to 0. And there's also a normalization condition here between uh, epsilon and plus and minus, which I think is uh, epsilon alpha mu, epsilon star beta mu is delta alpha beta. Is that right? Yeah. It's delta alpha beta. And that, of course, normalization condition w would have to be used to get, to get these commutation relations. I should have mentioned it. All right. So now we've rewritten the polarization vectors in terms of these functions on the sphere. And now, this is the formula um, which uh, we gave in the homework. Let's consider a zero z of u z z bar. So that is, by definition, the limit as r goes to infinity of a z r u z and z bar. OK, so now using these formulas, we can take all the Q's in, in here and we can rewrite them in terms of points on the sphere. So we can rewrite it think, in a way that it's easy to identify uh, the point on the sphere that they're going to. And one finds that this is equal to, 
So this, of course, has an expansion in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So this has an expansion in terms of a creation and annihilation operators. And what would you expect this to be before I write down the answer, which you're going to derive in the homework? It's kind of tedious. But, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's really important. So, uh, you know, so what would you expect this to be? Well, this should create and annihilate photons that land at the point Z and Z bar. What else could it do? You know, it's an operator that's localized at the point in the sphere. And moreover, we would expect that Z, that AZ, would correspond to, since Z gets, uh, if you do a rotation about the point Z, A sub Z will get one phase, and AZ bar would get the other phase, we would expect that AZ will create one helicity, one definite helicity, and annihilate the other helicity for photons going to that point, and AZ bar would, would do the opposite. So the answer is indeed that this is equal to minus i over 8 pi squared, square root of 2, times e over 1 plus zz bar times the integral from 0 to infinity d omega a plus helicity out omega x hat, I'll explain this in a second, e to the minus i omega u plus, or minus actually, a minus out dagger of omega x hat e to the plus i omega u. Where x hat is related to z, so how do, how do, so these, um, So the outs depend on a three vector, including the, the creation annihilation operators depending on a three vector, including their magnitude. Omega so, uh, x hat is a unit vector that point that points to the point z on the sphere, and the relationship between x hat one, x hat two, and x hat three is and the point z is precisely this relationship here with w's turned into z. So this guy uh, annihilates a positive helicity photon, which is headed to the point x hat uh, of z. And yeah, I should write this x hat is equal to x hat of z z bar, um, which is headed to the point z. And this one annihilates a negative helicity photon headed to the same point. And this operator, of course, it's not a zero mode. It can create and annihilate photons of all, uh, of all different uh, frequencies. So what we've succeeded in doing here is finding the basic relationship between the fields that we've been using, these out fields in the 1 over r expansion and scribe plus, and the standard outgoing uh, creation and annihilation operator in the plane wave expansion of uh, usually employed in, in, in quantum field theory. I better stop there. I'm a little bit over. Yeah, Tarek?
No, A is her Hermitian. Um, A minus out A minus out dagger is A plus out. Right. The Hermitian conjugate of an operator that creates a positive chirality field is a, yeah, not. No, A plus dagger. So if we were to, actually, no, of course this isn't her mission. Sorry. Of course this isn't her mission because AZ is not real. AZ is roughly AX plus IAY. So, so this is a, sorry, yeah. That's right. Sorry, I, I said something wrong there. If we took the Hermitian conjugate of this, we would get, AZ bar, which would do the opposite thing. 